Father, we thank you. We bless your great name. Thank you for dealing generously with us and to us during the course of the contact. And here we are again. And we ask that you will visit us yet again. Send your light and send your truth into our hearts in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. You're welcome to church this evening for, for those of us that able to make it physically tonight. The Lord bless you. And you are streaming online. You are welcome to church as well in Jesus' name. Last night after we were done with um, the contact, myself and um, Reverend Dan, we were at the hotel with um, our guest and we were talking and um, we were having discussions along different lines. And um, the burden of the Lord was becoming heavier upon our hearts. Uh, we couldn't leave. It was almost 12 midnight that we, we had to be forced to leave so that our man of God can rest for his journey this morning. And it's becoming obvious that... Uh, responsibilities for the destiny of the church is stepping down on the shoulders of a generation. And how far and how much the kingdom of God is going to accomplish and become is largely depended on uh, the leadership of the day. And we can have a leadership generation that will run the race, they will run their errand, creating advantage for other generations to build upon. And uh, it's obvious that we have to rise up and take responsibility for the things of our father's house or else. Um, the conclusion is that no one else will do it. Praise the Lord. The place where we stand now is, if God has asked you to do something, don't assume he told somebody else to do it. And if he asks you to do something, uh, perhaps if somebody else was told to do it, it may just be that the person is not doing it. That is why you are the next in line in hope that you will do what God wants to do. And um, one of the things we harped on while we talked is a subject matter of the, the landscape, the landscape, the spread of the church as it stands right now, where we have people who have experienced the world, okay? They've tasted the world, they've experienced the world, they've known sin practically, they repent with zeal and with passion, and because of how much they were forgiven, they get to come on board with much love for the master. And what you get to see on display is a lot of passion, a lot of commitment, a lot of fire. Sometimes there is this sense of knowing that you have wasted time and because of that, you need to catch up. And most people that come into the kingdom at that level, uh, they come without the foundation compared to Let's say a Timothy generation. You know Timothy? I would say from a, from a childhood, Timothy had known the Holy Scriptures. It means God, he began his journey with God from the foundation. He went through Sunday schools and all of that. I was telling a man of God, I said, while you were singing those hymns, I was feeling this whole thing came hard on me. 
that there are songs that are native to Zion that a generation has come and all they know is what they know. You get the whole thing. The days when we have, you can sing a hymn and weep because of the life, the, transform, the transforming life and power within those hymns, those days are gone. They are not gone because they are gone. They are gone because of a generation that didn't know that we have such heritage. They gave their life to Christ, came into the kingdom as matured people. They didn't experience foundation. And people get into the kingdom from where they meet it. And what that means is for some of you that, that have come here, let's say this year, you will not have uh, been diligent enough to know what has been preached in RCN at the inception, maybe the first year of our existence, the second year, and all of that. You are meeting us at the level of power. You are meeting us at the level of demonstration manifestation. But you didn't meet us when we sweated and all of that. And all that you know, the precedence that you get to take off with is the precedence of the law of the present moment, present conditions. There is no history. And if we continue like that, we, we're going to have the landscape changing. A new generation coming on board without the old truths. I get you what I'm saying. In 2022, yeah, I, I felt the Lord telling me to begin to teach old truth to a new generation. What that means is, don't teach those big, big things. Okay? Teach foundation, fundamentals, the basics, the essentials, and the sacrosancts of our faith. So that you don't find a people strong in big things, but weak in the everyday things. That is why you find a generation that an unbeliever knows that this thing you are doing is wrong. But a generation has arisen that can grind power, they can generate power, but don't have the life that God can count on, don't have the life that God can depend on. And many things are becoming stale and dead because of lack of attention. And as preachers, as ministers, the pressure to maintain the reputation, the pressure to maintain the congregation, the pressure to maintain the rating and everything, that hype is so strong that we don't even know where we are at right now. Surveys were done in the East, global, global West, and part of the subject matter were matters of the virgin birth. the immaculate conceptions. And about, if my memory serves me right, about 65% don't believe that Jesus was born by a virgin. They didn't believe in the divinity of Jesus. And if that continues like that for the next 25, 30 years, and men without foundation grow into leadership, the church is already at the, at, at the brim of extinctions. You hear some messages by, and then another aspect we're having right, ah, Lord have mercy, is men with the tools of the kingdom, they pray a lot, they fast a lot, but they teach philosophies and psychology. And the confusion now is he's teaching this thing but the anointing is there at work. And it's very easy to begin to accept those contents, philosophies, psychologies, and the things you find in, on, in, in, this, in the commonplace, you find them being added to the articles of the kingdom. There were times where kings conquered Israel they took away um, the vessels of the, of the temple. 
and then under king rules, they took away golden vessels. He replaced every one of them with brass. Ministry continues, service continues, but it is only those who knew what was taken away that weep. And I can tell you, I, I feel the pain of where our generation and where Christianity is going to. Praise the Lord. Sometimes you just, you can't even talk. And my conclusion is, we're going to go back. Truth is our main handle. Truth is a vehicle for transference. Truth is a vehicle for longevity. Is that okay? So that is why we are coming around subject matters like redemption. We're going to work on it as much as we can in this season. And then possibly if the Lord gives us allowance, during our Easter faith retreat uh, next year, we are going to sit on this matter. Praise the Lord. Amen. The matter of redemption, if you read your Bible carefully, especially if you read from the Old Testament, there are certain words you are going to be finding, uh, standing out, especially when you hit Exodus, you begin to hit Leviticus and all of that. You're going to begin to find certain sensitive words around the temple worship and temple service. One of such words is called atonement. Can you say atonement? Say atonement. The next word you will find is called ransom. Say ransom. Ransom. Another word is redemption. Can you say redemption? Amen. And as you proceed, you're going to be finding words like salvation then you find words like regeneration, words like reconciliation, words like justification, words like glorification. All of these are, they are pillars of the journey that men, uh, a man that comes to God and backs on and the things that are accomplished for us in Christ Jesus. Um, I've exposed to us the book of uh, Acts chapter, okay, let's look at the book of Acts chapter 26 one more time. Um, the breath of God is on that and the truth of God is captured for this season. Uh, Acts 26, we'll read from verse, um, uh, all right, we'll read from verse 14. This is Paul giving an account of his encounter on his way to Damascus. You know the story, so I just want to take off from uh, verse of uh, interest so that we can journey fast. And when we were falling to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, So, so, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, Who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. But rise, and stand upon thy feet. For I have appeared unto thee for this purpose, to make thee a minister and a witness, both of those things which thou hast seen, and of those things which, those things in the which I will appear unto thee. Verse 17. Delivering thee from the people and from the Gentiles, unto whom now I send thee. And these persons that he's sending them to, there are conditions, uh, there are five conditions that these persons find themselves in that is highlighted in verse 18. Can we take verse 18? Number one, to open their eyes. God is sending Paul on an errand. And the first thing that Paul needs to do, one of the, the items on the list, is to open the eyes of the people to whom he is sending, them, sending him to. For their eyes to be needing to be open means they are what? Means they are. So we are dealing with the condition of blindness. Okay? Number two, and to turn them from darkness to light. So we have blindness, then we have under condition of darkness. Can you see that? Hello? Do you understand what we're saying here? 
The reason why we need to go back to this is because if you don't know the condition that the fallen man is in, you will think that anything can save such a man. The moment Queen Esther heard that Mordecai was in, in sackcloth and ashes, you know what she did? What did she do? She went to the, sent to the boutique, they got clothes. A man is wearing burden. A man is wearing pain, grief. This man is in a soul agony because of what the enemy is planning. But a generation thinks that the solution to the problem is garment. Just give him the reason why uh, maybe it's because since I became queen of the, in the kingdom, I have not sent clothes to him. Maybe his clothes are worn out. They sent, she sent garments to, the, to, to Mordecai. Mordecai said, no, 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 no. You are in the kingdom for such a time as this. And if you hold your peace all together, God is going to raise deliverance. It was until Esther understood the matter on ground, she knew that what she should put on is no garment. You know what she did? She took, called her maids and said, go and tell Mordecai. Pro proclaim a fast throughout the whole realm of Israel in captivity. Nobody eats, nobody drinks. I am going to drop my, my, my royalty and everything. I'm going to put on solution. And for three days and three nights, this queen had to put on fasting. Herself, she had to put on sackcloth and ashes. Because that is the right dressing for the moment. That when we don't know the real problem, we can be using Vaseline to, to treat cancer. This matter is, is festering, is terminal, but you are using paracetamol. Talk to the person say, your body is hot because you are using wrong instrumentation. Have you found people that go to the hospitals and then they say, ah, I just came to see doctor for checkup and when they use instruments and check them, they say this is an emergency and they admitted them on the spot. The person went there by himself and he just felt my body is hot. But in the, in the light of the right instrument, he described this one has seven days to live without an urgent attention. And they admit the person. The man who is not yet born again is blind. He doesn't know where he's going to. Number two, even if he had eyes, there's another condition that he's facing. What's the condition? He's in darkness. How do you tell a blind man and a deaf man, all right, that a vehicle is coming to clear him out of the way. Yeah! Roar. The man is no hearing and he cannot see. That is a complicated situation that requires desperate response. At the fall, this is the storyline of man's condition. Number one, man is blind. Secondly, he is in darkness. Thirdly, based on the five-point agenda that God gave to Paul, this man is blind, the man is in darkness, and then he is under the power of Satan. Can you see that the solution to blindness is sight? The solution to darkness is light. The solution to the power of Satan is the power of God. And at different points, all of these answers must be rolled out, peeled out to a man for a man to experience complete, total, and holistic deliverances. It is in this third one that gift operations come in. Spiritual gifts. Because the Bible says you cannot get into the house of a strong man that is armed. Say, when a strong man armed keeps his palace, his goods, everything are intact. But when a strong man is stronger than him shall come upon him and overpower him and take from him the weapon, the armor where he, he trusted, at that time you are able to spoil his goods. So you are going to need a different set of tools for the third point on the agenda. Do you get what I'm saying? Number four, 
that they may receive forgiveness of sins. And the fifth one is an inheritance among them which are sanctified by the faith that is in me. These are the five point agendas that Paul, God handed to Apostle Paul. And this captured the condition and the context of the mission field that he's been deployed to. So that when you get there and you see people living the way they are, they are living carelessly, just know that these are blind men and men in darkness. And in addition to that, they are now under the power and dominion of Satan and the matter of guilt is there. And they don't have an inheritance. It means from the start of their lives to the end of their lives without encountering God, they live empty, start to finish. I don't know if you get it. Now look at the book of Ephesians chapter 2. In addition to these five conditions we, find, we have here, and of which Ephesians was written by, the, by Apostle Paul, and this is part of the understanding of his mission field, and he's writing to the, Ephesians, the church in Ephesus. He said, and you had he quickened, who were dead. How many, condi what, how many conditions do we have now? In Acts chapter 26, verse 18, we have five conditions, blindness, being in darkness, under the power of Satan, guilt, no inheritance. Number six is that you were dead. And the response that God proffered to dead men is to enliven them. Do you get it? You were dead in trespasses and in sins. Okay? This man is dead. He's dead in trespass and sin. Thirdly, he said, we are in the time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the earth, the spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the loss of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we are by nature the children of wrath, even as others. So, under condition that this man that is not born again is, he is under judgment. Do you get that? Praise the Lord. If a man is under judgment, it means that it's a sentence on his life. He's been convicted. Verdict has been given. Judgment has been passed. And the wages of sin is death. You get what I'm saying? This judgment is hanging over the life of this man. And without anything being done, this man... This man is in, a, is in a desperate situation and is in a state of emergency. And every day that passes, he is, he, he is on the touch line. The truth of the matter is, a family member, an unbeliever who dies in his sin, is actually done. Praise the Lord. It was around 2006 or so that God told me that you know me now as a God of mercy. The time we come, we will become the God of judgment. And you, mercy can only be obtained at a particular time. The moment you close your eyes in time, a person passes on, the next thing is judgment. Scripture says it is appointed unto man once to die. And the next item after that item of death is judgment. And it is against this backdrop that you see that man is in a desperate condition. I'd like us to look at Psalms, um, I think Psalms 47. Praise the Lord. Amen. Psalms, um, we'll do Psalms 40, 49, verse 7. But let's read from verse 1. Hear this, all ye people. Give ear, all ye inhabitants of the world, both low and high, rich and poor. My mouth shall speak wisdom, and the meditation of my heart shall be of understanding. 
I will incline my ear to a parable, and I will open my dark saying upon the harp. Wherefore should I fear in the days of evil, when the iniquities of my heels shall compass me about? They that trust in their wealth and boast themselves in the multitude of their, rich, of their riches. None of them can by any means redeem his brother. Nor give a ransom for him. For the redemption of their soul is precious and is seized forever if it is not redeemed. That's the end of it. That he should still live forever and not see corruption. For he seeth that wise men die, likewise the fool and the brutish person perish and leave their wealth to others. Verse 7 says, none of them can by any means redeem his brother, nor give to God a ransom for him. Remember the kind of people that we address from the beginning. The first set of persons that we ad address were all ye people and all ye inhabitants of the world. There's an address that is channeled to those who are yet alive and can do something about their condition. Verse 2 says, both low and high. You have a class or you are classless. You are rich or you are poor. Together, this inadequacy, this helplessness uh, affects everybody. Whether you are wealthy, your money is not enough to ransom your soul or the soul of your brother. If salvation were by money, I hope many of you, you know that. Amen. Before it will get to your turn, judgment would have ended. <laughs> Praise the Lord. And there are those that can buy enough and keep. They have spear part of salvation. But unfortunately, the Bible says in the book of, in a verse Verse um, 8, say for the redemption of their soul is precious. And whenever scripture calls something precious, just know that there are no parameters for evaluation among men. Hallelujah. Like your life is precious. You cannot replace it. If you have money, if you have valuables, you can only determine the condition of that life. But you cannot restore it and say, I pay one billion, give me back my life. Go to the counter of Hades and then drop $15 billion and say, I need that life back. It doesn't even work. Because the soul is precious. Your life is precious. And there are many precious things that we have that we may not be able to place Naira and Kobo, dollar and pounds, euro value to them. But if they are not there, it affects every other thing that we have. One of such things is the joy of the Lord in your heart. It's something more than gold. It's something more than silver. The spirit of the Lord in the heart of man is something more. Gold is valuable. But the spirit of God in the life of a man is precious. Praise the Lord. And he said the redemption is precious It has a premium value. Praise the Lord. Amen. And God is in the business of looking for ransoms. God is in the business of looking for redemption. Something that he will give and then get you back from the marketplace of sin. The slave market of sin. Okay? When we talk about redemption... Let's say what they call that is, um, you know what they call, you know collateral? You know collateral? You need one million, but you don't have one million, but you have something worth a million or more than a million. You go to the bank or whatever, they give facilities, you tender it and say, I need this. You are giving me this money at an interest rate or 
given time uh, duration. If I don't bring it back, this is the, the compensation for what you are giving me. So that if you took one million naira and you drop your car, the car is worth seven million. That that car can be auctioned for 2.5 million, not at the value it, it is to you, but whatever they are going to use to close up that deal. You get the whole thing. And if you're going to get your car back, you don't go with 500,000 and say, see 500,000, give me back my car. The value that was given to you is a million. If there's an interest of 20% on top of it, whatever the agreement is, you compound it with the interest, take it back, and then you redeem what you staked. Do you get what I'm saying? Man is sold. Man is a slave. He is in bondage. The marketplace of sin, the marketplace of iniquity, is where is a trading floor where man is carrying out activities. He wants to come out, but he doesn't know how to come out because for you to come out of that enclosure, the ransom had to be paid. The redemption had to be tendered. And unfortunately for man without God, the ransom is precious. Man does not have it. Are you there? If you find yourself in such a situation and someone comes to bail you, you know, that person becomes an important person to you. You get, you get what I'm saying? Yeah. That person becomes an important person. Let's look at the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 5, maybe from verse 14. I will just walk around the background, then give us a list of the things we're going to be working on and see how far we go. For the love of Christ constrained us because we judged that if one died for all, then we're all dead, verse 15. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. The picture in this few verse we have read is someone has committed a crime, and the, person, the crime is a crime that is worthy of death. The judgment has been passed. Sentence has been given. Death is what is looming and hanging over such a man. Maybe to establish this before I come back again, let's look at the book of, um, the book of John chapter 3, verse 18, and then uh, 36 thereabout. He that believeth on him, ah, go back to verse 16. I want to run, but I also want to build. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that true, that the world through him might be saved. Post there. What is the who is the person that needs salvation? I'm asking this question to paint to you the picture of the condition that the world is in. So that when you see uh, the world and all ye people being addressed in Psalms 49 from verse 1, you will know that that address is to a people in a condition. Is that okay? That the world through him might be saved. So the world is needing salvation and the world came into this condition of needing salvation by the fall. That is captured in the book of Romans chapter 5, where the Bible says, by, by one man's sin. You get the whole thing now. We're going to get into that. Verse 18 now of this verse, of this John chapter 3. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned. How? Already. It means the one that does not believe is living, walking, shopping, marrying, condemned. The default condition of the unsaved man is that the sentence has been passed already. He that believed not is condemned already because he had believed, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is where the matter is complicated. 
a man is in a situation, all right, that is judgment passed, he's already condemned, waiting for execution, and God didn't need to do anything about it in the first place. It's like somebody disobeyed you, you said, don't touch this, and the person went and don't touch this cable, and the person went there and touched the cable, and they got electrocuted. Is that your business? The person disobeyed, and then this is the consequences of disobedience. Don't, don't you forget in it. That you didn't need to do nothing. There was no cause. There was no obligation. It's a system where there is righteousness, there is judgment. Thou shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Because in the day you eat of it, in that day, in dying, you will start dying. And you will be dying until you die. You will keep dying until you die. I know death has different expressions. Death, the event, death, the progression. Sickness and all of those things that happen, they are outplaying the outworking of death. So that a man is dying until he dies. And that began to happen to man. And God wouldn't have lost anything. There would be no judgment. Nobody will condemn God. Say, ah, why didn't you save this person? We, the, this, this person is living in the just punishment for the infractions and the disobedience. And if God were there and he did nothing, nothing really spoiled. But now the person is in a need, in need. And without something being done urgently, that person is going to die. And God steps out of himself in love. That is why you find John chapter 3 verse 16. It says, for God so loved the world. The world I was describing in Psalm 49, and then eventually we see that we are having a problem of ransom. Nobody can give something in exchange. We don't have what it takes to give in exchange for souls. You cannot ransom your brother. You cannot ransom yourself because the price, the ransom, the value is precious. Now somebody comes and say, what's going on here? Say, uh, he stole. Okay? The penal code states that if you steal, this is a punishment. You are going to be executed by death by a firing squad. That's the judgment. It is righteous for the person to be executed because of the crime. And then the judge who sat in judgment over the case um, said, okay, what you did, the punishment for this is death. It's written. And then bang, bangs the gavel. Bam. You began to cry. You know that the people you are seeing is the last because from the witness box, going straight to the prison where the person waits for the day and date of execution. Then eventually, the judge has a son. Let's look at the book of Romans chapter 6, verse 23. I want to paint this thing with scripture so that it is not going to be my story. For the wages of sin is death. This is a just recompense for sin. Is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. This eternal life was not sent by the hand of Jesus. Okay? You will think, oh, this eternal life came. God does carry Jesus. Take, go and give them eternal life and then come back. No. No. The administration around eternal life coming through is not as easy and as cheap as it appears on the pages. Verse 24. Verse 24 of Romans 6. Hey, awake, mama. Papa, Okay, all right. So, okay, chapter 3, verse 23, rather. So, from Romans 6, 
we are seeing the wages of sin is what? Is death, right? So go to verse 23, 24 of chapter 3. Okay, maybe we'll start from verse 23 again to, come, to establish the condition. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Verse 24. Being justified freely by grace through the redemption, the buyback, the exchange, the replacement, the substitution that is in Christ Jesus. This man sinned. The wages of sin, according to Romans chapter 3, 6, 23, is death, okay? But instead of this man dying, someone else is going to die on his behalf, okay? We are being justified freely. It means you didn't pay anything. There was no ransom in your hand that could have sufficed for this to happen. So it was done for you free, but it wasn't cheap. Can you say free? Salvation is free, but it is not cheap. Salvation is free, but not cheap. It came to you freely because it was paid for. Hallelujah. 25. I'd like you to see how it happened. Whom God had set forth to be the propitiation, propitiation through faith in his blood, to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. This is a sacrifice that is put on the table that met all the demands, all the requirements until the judgment is fully executed and then now you find yourself in a condition of favor. Verse 26. To declare, I say, at this time, his righteousness. Because we are dealing with matters of righteousness, we are dealing with matters of justice, then God is now intruding with love and mercy. Hello? If you get to the law court, you hear ignorantia juris non excusant. It means the ignorance of the law is not an excuse. Say, I didn't know that this is, kidnapping is a sin in this country. Whether you know or you don't know, there is a law to that effect. And what a man is going to face is the judgment that is written. And because God is righteous, yet he wants to show mercy. And God is not going to show mercy by looking away from what is done wrong. Because in the court of divine justice, the wages of sin is what? Death. And everywhere, every time that is seen, the next thing that you will see is what? Death. And this righteous judge understands the constitution very well that in order to show mercy, he still has to be righteous. Because Satan is going to accuse God. He's going to accuse him. You say the wages of sin is death. And this man sinned. And the judgment is written. You know it. Because of the righteous judge of all the earth, the righteous judge, the judge of all the earth should do righteously, should do right. You cannot set this person free. It's not judgment without justice. This is judgment with justice establishing righteousness. And because God is saving the sinner man, still had to do it as the incorruptible judge, what he did was he provided a ransom. 50 years incarceration. He's going to serve a lifetime in jail. Great. This is a judgment. Everything is righteous and correct. Now someone else is going to take the place of the man who has been sentenced. So the man who has been sentenced is walking on the streets of Lagos, the streets of Makodi, free. People that knew what he did and that led to him being sentenced, they are seeing him on the street. They are wondering, is not the guy, ah, somebody died for him. Somebody took his sentence. That he might be just and the justifier of him that believeth on Jesus. 
So that when God is saving you, he will not save you and become unrighteous. Even your labor of love, the Bible says God is not unjust to forget. This is what you have done. Talk more of the things that you, you can't even help yourself to do nothing good yet. And what God did in saving you is he ensured that all the requirements of divine justice were fulfilled, but the judgment, the sentence was laid on someone else so that you can go free. The reason is if there is no ransom, there is no ransom to redeem the sinner man, the man who is condemned and sentenced, uh, the, the axe is already laid at the foot of the tree. That is why we are merchandise. We are we, we, we the merchandise we carry is the merchandise of God's mercy. I did government. I was an art student, and in government there is something that is called prerogative of mercy. All right, the prerogative of mercy that is extended by the government of our day um, is they don't provide ransom. We know this man emptied, he looted the national treasury, then another looter, another corrupt man comes and uses his power based on his office to declare the person free. He has, been, he has not satisfied the claims of justice. You already pr pronounce the person free and then the person goes free in the eyes of the law. But God did this matter differently. That God did not violate his nature of righteousness in showing mercy to a sinner who is deserving of judgment. There was judgment actually. The judgment was executed, but someone else received the, 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 the penalty, the judgment. Someone else, it was executed on someone else on behalf of the man who is standing there guilty. You can't even raise a pre preliminary objection because he's guilty as charged. Now, this condition the man is in, complicated and compounded as we have elaborated here, you see that even if the man was to have been said, okay, uh, you have been released. Someone else is bearing the weight of the law on your behalf. The person is still a bad guy. The next time you're going to find him back to the same place because he was a discharged sinner, but nothing was done to him. And God, in saving us, saved us all the way. And it's part of what this emphasis and subject matter of redemption is. You know, I told you guys during the course of the contact that I had attempted suicide three times. And I can tell you the reason why I went all the way trying to take my own life was because of the weight of sin. I just knew that this is wrong and I cannot help myself. Young guy, but large on iniquity. So just end it. Just end your life. Let all of these struggles end because this man is under the weight of sin and there is no way he is able to help himself. And um, the complication that came to man by reason of the fall is... Is, is much, it's extensive, it's comprehensive, and there are different layers and levels of redemption that God accomplished to bring the man to the place where uh, the man can be on the same ground that God will have him to be. Psalms 107 verse 20. I like us to read it very fast. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their he delivered them from their... How many destructions do we have there? It's in the plural. It means it's more than one. It means the problem that man is dealing with is complicated. Is there anybody here, I don't know about you, but for myself, when I rededicated my life to Christ, you know, I, I noticed that when I go to church and they are singing, Blessed be the name of the Lord who is worthy to be praised and adored. So we lift up holy hands in one accord, singing, blessed be your name. When people are lifting up holy hands and I lift up holy hands, 
I noticed Westlife, Tupac, Puff Daddy, Genuine, Usher Raymond, <laughs> Jay-Z. Those are the songs that come to my heart. And then when that happens, my hands become heavy. Then Satan begins to tell you, it's not people like you that lift up holy hands. You know what is going on? Matters of forgiveness of sin is accomplished, all right? But there are other things that are there. And God's salvation is intended to be comprehensive. Next, on campus, I rededicated my life to Christ in 2003, April. And by November 15th, I had my admission letter that same year. By February 29th, I had moved to campus. And um, I'm going around. It was on campus I discovered that ladies are beautiful. You know, when you see a collocation of many women and all of them are fine, it puts pressure on your past to begin to threaten to relapse. Have you seen beautiful ladies? One of those days I saw a, a fair lady with brown. When you look at her from, from her head to her toe, it's brown. I'm like, this is something else. I looked at this and I had to. I started crying. On the day of our matriculation, I went to the matriculation gr ground. Uh, I went to school like John the Baptist. You know, this repentant guy. On the day of our matriculation, we were at the matriculation ground congratulating people, shaking. Then we started hugging. I didn't hug ladies. After hugging a few ladies... I started feeling energy. <laughs> Thank God the matriculation gown is a gown. <laughs> I see holy people in this. I'm saying this while you add me on your prayer list. Amen. It was a, the matriculation gown was a gown. So there's a way you just cover it and then I, I, humil I felt assaulted. I went back to the hostel and then took it up and lay on the ground and said, God, in this BSU, if you don't help me, I am gone. I mean some kind of energy that I couldn't imagine. I knew that there was a need for redemption somewhere. Lay down, cried to God, slept. My roommates, re they returned back, knocked. Everybody in the room here outside except me. So, the conclusion was that I brought a spoil from matriculation ground. All right? And they kept knocking. I was deeply out of sorrow and praying from sorrow of heart. I slept. When I opened the door, they were so shocked that it was me alone in the room. I wept for my soul because this condition, that atmosphere was putting pressure on my salvation. You see beautiful ladies all over the place and I began to fast, you know, to starve the energy of the flesh. And I became so lean like later C. And one lady, and I can't forget that lady, she said, Tony, Tony, you the lean, no? I said, hey. My goal is, I didn't come to BSU to come and lose this salvation. And especially if you, if your salvation was expensive, if you needed the salvation you got. And then I said, she wanted to start cooking for me. That if I, if I had full flask, she would be cooking and bringing food for me. She just want to be full flask minister. And I told her, Ene, you can't finish what you want to start. Because someday, that food will put pressure on an aspect of my life. And you will bring food and you will wait to carry the cooler. And then while you are waiting, you, you might just be so tired that you sleep off. You're going to find that as you receive forgiveness of sins, all right? You get what I'm saying? 
they have now said, okay, that sin you committed is canceled. There is something else about who you are that needs to be addressed as well. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. I've seen believers that fornicate. They are born again. But they fornicate. And it's because even though they have received forgiveness of sins, there is a nature of sin that needs to be worked on. And all of that is part of the package. So, as God goes out to redeem us, there are, I have up to nine, eight different stages, phases, and levels of redemption that God accomplishes for us. And the first one is redemption from sin. So that in Psalms 49 and then the book of Job, we now have found a ransom. And that ransom is in a person. And that person's name is called Jesus Christ. Number two is redemption from the curse of the law. The third aspect of our redemption is redemption from the world, this present evil world. And the fourth one is a redemption procedure that we require that we are involved in it. That is a redemption of time. Iniquity can keep you being reticulated around weaknesses and everything that uh, you are, say, Ephraim is now having white, gray hair on his head, but he's not aware. The matter of redemption of time, and we're going to trust the Lord to work on this. And if we're able to put these structures on ground before the end of the year, I would consider this year a ministerial success. And this is especially if you are taking in all the emphasis that's come. Redemption from futility. Wastage of our life and time. Efforts. Vanity. Redemption of our body. We're going to talk about that. And when we're dealing with redemption of the body, then we're going to see the place of healing, which is a, 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 an, a, an instrumental redemption of this body until the glorification of this mortal body. And it is in the redemption of the body you will understand the damages that sicknesses and diseases do to these mortal bodies. Then the redemption of the gifts of God and the callings of God, the gifts of God and the callings of God, which I said that um, happened on during the course of the contact. Um, by the time we have redemption of gifts, redemption of time, redemption of from futility, redemption of the body will be made easier. Then even creation is also waiting for redemption. You get what I'm saying? And all of these are laid out of the things that God wants to do. By reason of the sacrifice of Jesus, the first installment, if we are going by the list of Paul in Acts 26 verse 18, the first thing that you get to receive is the fourth one, which is the forgiveness of sins. All right? The forgiveness of sins is the first one that you get to experience like comprehensively. It happens instantaneous. It happens completely. The day God forgave you your sins, he forgave you all your sins. A young man was to come and meet, see me um, from one of the states. The elder brother who is a pastor requested that he comes to see me. And um, we, I said, okay, send me his contact. Let me prep him up for his coming and all of that. We got talking, okay, this is the obstacles and everything. Come, I'll take care of your accommodation and all of that. And uh, he said, he started listening to one of uh, Father in the Lord's message and then he discovered that this is, he is born again. And after he started listening to the messages, he discovered he was a bad guy. He was a very bad guy. And every time I speak with him, he say, Pastor Tony, guy, if you know the kind of sin I just discovered I was a very sinful man. 
can God forgive me? Uh, the, the, the sins I, I committed. Every time I, um, this year, okay, I began to run out of patience. And then I started cutting short my discussion with him. Every time he calls me, I say, where are you? I'm seeing so, I say, come to, I will speak to you from Makodi. I will not talk to you from any other place apart from Makodi. And the things that he's always bringing every time we meet is the weight of his sins. How sinful the sins he committed were. How grievous the sins were. How offended God was and all of that. But the thing is the moment a ransom was found, the matters of the sins you committed were addressed 100%. Bible say, if we say we have no sin, give me First John chapter 1, I think verse 5 there about. This is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. This is part of Paul's agenda, okay? The item number two, according to Acts 26 verse 18 list. You get it? Darkness. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Many believers are still caged in the prison house of guilt of the sins they've committed for which God has forgiven them. Someone called me on Friday. And they say, Pastor, pray for me. Say, what is the issue? Say, I have this particular sickness. And I feel it's God's punishment for my sins. And I say, have you given your life to Christ? Have you? He say, what, what happened? I say, what happened? He say, I failed God. I say, have you settled with your father? She say, yes. Have you confessed to God? She say, yes. And at that moment, I was reading First Kings, no, Second Kings chapter 2 verse 19. Put it on, on display. And the men of the city said unto Elisha, I pray thee, the situation of this city is pleasant and as my Lord see it, but the water is not and the ground barren. This was what I was reading, verse 20, while I took the call. And he said, bring me a new cruise and put salt therein and they brought it to him. This is a repentance, a new life. And when they brought it to him, look at what he said in verse 21. This was this verse that was bold on the screen while I was speaking with the lady. And he went forth onto the spring of the waters and cast the salt in there and said, Thus said the Lord, I have healed these waters. God is saying, I have healed it. He didn't say I will. He said, I have. Healed in past tense. And while I was talking with this lady and finding out from God, the Holy Ghost pointed my attention to the screen. Said, Thus hear the Lord. I have healed these waters. And I said, This is the word of the Lord to you. I have healed these waters. I have healed these waters. And the more I kept saying it, demonic manifestations started on the other side. And then, see, don't, I said, I hear it. Don't, I don't want to hear those words. Don't read those scriptures. I said, Thus hear the Lord. I have healed these waters. I have healed. I kept repeating until bam. Say you are healed. Seven days go to the lab. Do test and send me the result. So that Satan will not keep you bound and say it is when God forgave you your sins, he dealt with the matters associated with sin. It is the same body broken for the forgiveness of your sins that was also broken for your healing. I'm saying this because men and women on ground online and those who will be listening in hereafter, you'll be receiving effortless healing. Because many of you, what is keeping you bound, you are feeling unworthy, is because of the guilt of sin. Go back to 
First John chapter 1 now. Give me that verse again. He said, when we have fellowship one with another, the blood of Jesus is not selective in his cleansing. You'll say, Kai, this one is abortion. This one is kidnapping. This one is, you told lie. Mm, yeah, lie, you can pass, but no. It is all sins. Can you say all sins? If you don't master your confidence in the forgiveness of your sins, Satan will play a prank on you. Just like I said, that when I'm singing in church, I'll begin to remember West Life, Don Williams. What is going on, oh brother Tony? Hey, then I began to speak my place in Christ Jesus. Ephesians 1 verse 6 was one of the scriptures that came, it, it came hard at me. I, was, I read it in a book and then I took it in my mouth. To the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he had made us accepted. We are the beloved. I am the beloved of God. You may not like me, but God likes me, and that's all that matters. They say if nobody like you, like yourself. In our place, they say, when lizard fall from up and land on the ground, and nobody clap and they begin to hail himself. I am the beloved of God. Because time and again, the memory of sin will come. But the memory had no potency to condemn you again. Yes. We were bad guys. But now we know we were bad guys. Paul said, and such were some of you. But ye are washed. Ye are sanctified. And all of this God did to take away sin. Amen. Part of the redemption that God accomplished for us is the redemption of sin. But just like I told us earlier, um, God didn't just save us by just reading the magic wand, using his sovereignty and everything. No. He provided what we call atonement. And this is the goal of God doing what he did. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10. Sometimes the house becomes lonely. I remember years back, um, everybody, all the, everybody in my house were all matured people. My younger sister, I practically nursed my Agido, Agido, my younger brother, who is here. I nursed him, and then my younger sister, who is bigger than me now, I practically nursed them. And a time came where there was no toy to play with at home. You know what? The house becomes lonely. So you carry your children and go and give to your mother. Then grandmother now, they now have work to do. They, they have something to keep them busy. It looked like Jesus was so lonely. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 10 says, For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. This is his stature. This is his status. From whom and it came from him. They were accomplished by him. In bringing many sons, we are unto glory. That is why your salvation has a destiny and a destination. There is something God wants to accomplish and there is a place you will eventually stand before God, blameless before his throne. I've been commended by the blood of the Lamb. My spirit, my soul, my body, I stand blameless. I can tell you, hmm, let me give you a secret. Let me give you a secret. If you're going to thrive, if you're going to thrive effortlessly, many men will not believe in what is happening in your life. There are times where a pastor will preach a message, you heard the message, but he still believe in who you were. Face your front. Face your front. I found that so that if they are going to relate with you, yeah, you used to tell lies. 17 years ago and today, 
that record of 17 years is still hanging. God does not remember. He doesn't even know. He doesn't even know if such a thing happened. But men will keep it. You must be here. In my father's house, I say, Proof of you. Yes, I am. We're going to sing that song. Give me back my scripture. Many persons you are pegged and tied because of the conscience and the consciousness of the sins you committed. But the Bible says, Hi, are you there? Why this is going on is because God wants to restore us back to our status. Where did man fall from? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And Jesus, by whom and from whom and by whom, for whom and by whom are all things in bringing many sons into glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. 11. For both he that sanctified and he that has sanctified are all of one. Okay. In, in Romans chapter 3, I think verse 26, God in justifying had to be just. You get that? And then go back to my Hebrews now. Here, in Hebrews now, you are seeing the sanctifier and the sanctified. And the Bible says they are all of one sort. For which cause, and because of this, he is not ashamed to call them what? Brethren. What brought the infraction, the breakage, the disconnect is what is being taken care of, number one, by the death of Jesus Christ. All right? But after Jesus died, he didn't leave us the way we are. He is the sanctifier. He is sanctifying us. Something is happening to our nature. I used to be a murderer, but I have obtained mercy. That is a testimony of Saul, Paul. He said, Jesus Christ came to save sinners and I have a chief tendency title in sinning. I am a coronated chief. And the reason why God went to a man like me is to show how far God is ready to go to show mercy, to save. Can you say I'm accepted in the beloved? Jesus is my sanctifier. I am sanctified. We are of the same substance. And because of that, Jesus Christ himself, I would say, he's not ashamed. When you see cow, will you, because you like meat, will you call cow your brother? Hello? Have you seen somebody see a goat and say, men and brethren? No. It's a shameful thing to do and to say. But when Jesus stands before the Father and he stands in the council, and they say, um, Isaiah, my brother. How many of us brought uh, the guys, you chat me on WhatsApp, and then you see my brother, -o, my brother. -o. It's one of my favorite response, because true, true, you are my brother. Yeah. My brother, my bro. Bro is not just something disparaging and denigrating. It's a status. You are first of all brethren with Jesus, then also one with another. And what has been accomplished? Bible says, even Jesus, that thing, sin is shameful. Do you understand? Yeah. He says, can you imagine the... 
I've been to the court. I've been sued in my life before. And I, I stood in the dock as a Reverend Tony. I can tell you, it felt like the ground opening and then let me just disappear. Then when you think about your wife, your children, everybody say, this too shall pass. It's not a place you want to be. When you hear Reverend, everybody's eyes goes up like this. And the Bible says Jesus was not ashamed. He was not ashamed. You are the brother of Jesus. If, you are, if it is a difficult mystery to understand, just find out if you have a brother, younger or elder. That is what this place is saying. In this case, Jesus is the, he was the only begotten of the father that was once upon a time full of grace and truth. But now, he is the firstborn among many brethren. And when we say brethren, it's not gender based. Or let's say brethren and sistren. Praise the Lord. Yeah. And he's not ashamed of it. He doesn't feel belittled or whatever. Say, ah, how can, you know, there are some persons that if you drop a proposal on their table, they first of all look at themselves and wonder, is it that something is wrong with me? Like, how does he see me that he's coming to tell me that God spoke to him? Because that's their level. It would be a shameful thing for them to walk with that guy to the altar. Say everybody is just marrying son of Bilonias and everything. Then you just come with one petumele. Say God spoke to you. <laughs> they are ashamed. <laughs> but the Bible says, you see, this matter is so settled that Jesus Christ is in a hurry to engage and to embrace. And he's not seeing you as someone that this bad guy, all these boys, all these boys, I'll not let somebody rest. Mm -mm. He's seen a brother. And God said, both he that sanctified and they who are sanctified are all of one. Question. By the time you have been redeemed, okay, what are the what are the the symptoms? What should we watch to know that you and um, him are all of one? There are areas you will need to look at, and it forms part of the description of glory restoration that God is talking about. Is that okay? Okay. One of that, um, okay, look at the book of Romans chapter 8, verse 29, very quickly. Romans 8, 29, we're going to come back to the book of Hebrews. For whom he did for new, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the first born amongst many brethren. So it means if you see Jesus come and we are all of one sort from the same father. If I come you should ask sorry um, correct me if I'm wrong. Do you know Jesus? Say yeah, Jesus Joseph. You know that is his earthly name. Many of you don't know. I say right they say Jesus, Son of God. In his early life, he was Jesus Joseph, JJ. <laughs> Praise the Lord. He's my brother. I think James will understand this better. James, the Lord's brother, is one of the descriptions they give to him. Even that he was the Lord's brother physically, he was something to hold on to. I don't know if that. He was the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. Amen. 
I don't know how, well, let me stay away from that. Praise the Lord. Now, earthly filial um, connection, you'll find it there. Talk more of the spiritual connection. And say he's not ashamed to call them brethren. And there's an image, a template, a pattern. Jesus is the pattern son. And every other person should look like, you know, yeah, every other person should look like him. If we look at you in your redeemed state, there are at least three things that has to be on board and it's part of the things we are working on as we treat the subject matter of redemption. You should look like Jesus in character. The sanctification um, that goes on will bring you to that point. You can come as a criminal, you came as a, an arm robber, came as, whatever you, it is that you come as, when you go through that tunnel, that process, the end product, what we will see at the end is Jesus in character. I'm not going to look like Jesus Christ physically because I don't even know how he looks like physically. Do you understand? Whether he is taller than myself or not taller than myself, whether he has more weight than myself, we're not saying come and be his size or be his height and everything, but these are qualities essence of Jesus, that if the Spirit of God is inside of you, you're going to find that. Number one is character. And the gateway for, oh, yeah, the gateway for that, for the cultivation of this Christ-like character in a believer is what we call the fruit of the Spirit. You get the whole thing? Are you there? The next is, you should look like Jesus in authority. And the authority that God puts on the life of a man, a woman upon the face of the earth has certain channels of expression. Is that okay? Hello? It has channels of expression where authority is put on display. Number one is the call of God on your life. The call is an office. When we say apostle, we're not talking about something, we're talking about an office of government and governance. The, in ministry. These are the avenues for the display and the exercise of authority. We should see you so that as the Father has sent me, in the same way I sent you then eventually you have been reconciled and then a ministry is given to us which is the ministry of reconciliation. That God is in Christ and is summoning men to salvation to himself through us. The third area that we're going to look like Christ so that when Jesus sees us, he is not ashamed to call us brethren um, one of the, the third ground is in power. Can you say power? And power forms the basis for the gifts of the Spirit. So, character, you find the fruit of the Spirit, right? Okay? Then, authority, you find the call of God and then the ministry lines that God puts on our lives. Then, power is the gifts Give me that verse in Psalms that says, as for me, I shall be satisfied when I awake in your likeness. This is, the psalm is giving the, the, the writer of the book of Psalm, giving a testament of his experience. See, every time I see that I look more like Christ, it gives me a lot of joy. Hello. Let me give you another key. Yeah, as for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness, I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Give it to us in another translation. And this is what believers should emphasize and prioritize as you walk with God. And me, I plan on looking you full in the face. When I get up, I will see your full stature and I leave heaven on earth. 
a David song which is sung for to God after. All right. Um, NLT. Because I am righteous, I will see you. When I awake, I will see your face. I will see you face to face and be satisfied. And in and I in righteousness, I will see your face. And when I awake, I will be satisfied seeing your likeness. G g go back to, okay, as for me, I shall see your face in righteousness. I will be fully satisfied when I awake to find myself seeing your likeness. And one of the places where you see his likeness is in you. Because we all, with unveiled faces, as we behold in a glass, something is happening to us. We are being changed into the same image we are beholding. And the psalmist in King James says, I shall be okay when I awake with thy likeness. When I look like you, I, my life, you know, I know I used to be an angry person before, but this 2024, my anger used to be before it reaches boiling point after two minutes. But now it takes like 24 hours before it reaches that level. You are making progress. All right? Yeah, you know, bad like before. Then as you go on, sanctification is going on. Transformation is going on. And the time comes where what you have left is the memory of you being an angry man. Because the substance, the present substance of that life is no longer there. Something is happening to you. You are being fashioned. You are being changed. Let me encourage someone. Psalms 139. Because on the journey of redemption, one of the problems we have on the journey of redemption is matured people making it difficult for growing people. Amen. Yeah, the Lord told me the work of the pastor is to protect the, the, protect the sheep. It is very easy for a man who went through the journey of mastery to now look at someone going through the journey and evaluate them from his present condition and mark all of them wrong. But if you are going to be with people and watch them grow, there is no child that was born an adult. You grow. And the child grew and waxed strong. You will need to see people waxing strong. Before they had no reason to lie, they lie. Now they lie because there is pressure. They are making progress. A time comes where under pressure, kill them. They will not tell lies. It's a journey. Go to verse 13. You need to be encouraged. One of the things I dealt with growing up with the Lord is the, the fact that as a believer, I could still think evil thoughts. Many of you are very holy. Some of us, we have killed plenty of people. You know where we kill them? Here. How? Why? Then the next thing is, I had to start giving my life to Christ again. I got born again, again. When they are preaching and the message is hot, I will go for water call again. Because I don't trust the last one. If the last one was real, why did I think bad thought when I saw that lady? When I saw that guy? When I saw that guy? Why did I think that bad thought? Then you need to come back and see that you are on a journey. Keep your eyes on the road. The journey is still a journey. You get what I'm saying? And it's very easy for matured people not to allow growing people to grow. Amen. Okay, go back to verse 12. Thy eyes did see my substance. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, okay. 13. 13 or 14, whichever one. Okay. For thou hast possessed my reins, thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, 
and that my soul knoweth right well. The Bible says that um, the, 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 the heart of a man knows its own sorrow and no one intermeddled with its joy. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And this man is taking pleasure in the things that God is doing in his life. Say, marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Verse 15. Say, my substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest part of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance yet being unperfect. In accounting, in uh, cost accounting, uh, stock, um, yeah, stock, and all of that. In the production line, there is something called finished goods. This one, ready for the market. Then there's another one that's called work in process or work in progress. All of those are also calculated under the asset of the company. Praise the Lord. We have the tires ready, but the chassis is not yet ready. But in the process, what we are intending to bring out is a vehicle. It's a, it's a chair. It's a table. But what we have right now is not complete. We have not even assembled it yet. We can't sell it at market value as it were, but if you give us some time, a table is going to be standing there. The chair will be standing there. He said, your eyes, this see my, my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy books, all my members were written, were written where, which in continuance we have fashioned. This is where the believer, the man who has received forgiveness of sin, this is the state you must fight to keep yourself. Where God is working on you. He is still working on me to make me what I'm to be. Say, it took him. Who knows the song? It took him so many days to make the moon and the stars and all of that. He's still working on me. My substance, which in con continuous we have fashioned, when, can you say when? As yet, there was none of them. So that sometimes you will look at the person, you look at your life, and then you're not seeing anything. It's like somebody asks, I've been praying for 21 days over a matter, nothing is happening. How do you know nothing is happening? The prank is a prank of when as yet. Can you say when as yet? It's a prank, it's a mind game. A young man was involved with some kind of addictions. And, um, and in one of our meetings, this guy gave a very elaborate prophecy about the international ministry status of RCN. He, he, he was so, it was one of the most the elaborate prophecies I've heard about RCN in a meeting like from the congregation. He began to speak and say, the nations are coming. Apostle, these people are coming and all of that. He spoke so elaborately and I said, wow, this is great. And this man, this guy was in an addiction. He was having difficulty. All manner of things were done to help him. Um, he couldn't pull through. I look for him, call him, visit, and all of that. And I, after some time, I met him. I said, oh God, where are you there? How far? He said, you know, uh, people say if you want to eat frog, eat the big one. Because it's like he's struggling and he's not working. And the Bible says right in the midst of the struggle is only a man who is alive that even has the guilt, feels the guilt of sin. When we were dead in sins and trespasses, we buy beer and put inside this two liter shampoo, shampoo gallon, the one they used to sell black market. That is the one who does buy and then we are drinking beer from inside. Full the thing. Because beer and seven of they look alike. And we sing Gouda is a mighty beer. Is a mighty. Oh, go, go, ro, bow before. This is what we are. <laughs> oh, am I? Lord have mercy. 
Sons and brow bow before him. He's a mighty bear. Then he's a mighty, no, he's a mighty. We were like, we were dead, living in sin and not having any consciousness that we were even doing anything wrong. That you can feel what you are doing, you did is wrong, means you are alive. And the deception Satan brings is you are struggling, give up, don't struggle anymore. Don't, the guy told me he doesn't want to be a hypocrite. If he sees he's living in sin, he just he now has a lady camped in his house. That is how he lost a brother. Because he didn't understand that. In continuance, my fashion, I was being shaped. I can tell you there is no man that will tell me that God is not working on my life that will believe you. Because I know me. I knew my sorrow. And I know my joy. I know how God is enlarged and increased in my heart. I grew up melancholy. I don't talk. Like, my goal is to be, you know, Godfather, mafia. If you offend me, even at your graveside, I'll come and take revenge. One of my grandmothers passed, and then there are some things that they say that I went to the, I stood over the grave there because he said over her dead body. I had to stand there. Forgiveness, if you die, will kick you inside the, inside the pit. Then I'm seeing my heart being changed, and you want me to believe that nothing is happening to me. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. You know why? Psalms 139. So that I'm not going to give up this. It doesn't matter what you know about me. Yes, you knew I was a bad guy. On campus, one Muslim guy looked at me and said, if A square can repent, anybody can be born again. Because they used to call me evil score. Chicago bull. Never laughing with nobody. I'm really surprised that I laugh with you guys. And now that I say I'm surprised that I laugh, I say, <laughs> I'm I don't know why people fear me. But you need to just come close to see that God has tenderized my heart. I can't stand the medical procedure. I can't stand the sight of blood. But it wasn't so. And they say, which in continuance we have fashioned when if you look, it looks like nothing is happening but something that's happening. Dead men don't struggle. It's living men that struggle. If the struggle is, if you are, find yourself struggling, you are alive. You are kicking, bro. Bro, you are kicking. Sister, you are kicking. You are alive. If you ever felt remorse, you ever felt really bad about what happened, you are kicking, you are alive. God is working. Because in the time past, we lived, this was an habitat. And because God is working, there is a destiny of my salvation. Concerning Paul, he said, for this cause I have appeared unto you. To make thee, you are not yet, but I'm making you. To make thee a minister and a witness, both of the things you have seen, and there are other things I will show you. I don't want to miss the things that God will show me. As I will continue changing. The journey of transformation, I'm not leaving the track. There was a point I got to where he felt like I was a woman. Is it, is it born again that make people to be looking down on you, my brother? Yes. Like a sheep to the slaughter. He opened not his mouth. Some persons need to respond, but for you, what God is doing in your life now, you need to keep quiet. And then the Holy Ghost begins to tell you, so allow yourself to be defrauded rather than for you to be more vengeful and full of anger and your like. Why me? Why you is because I have appeared unto you for this purpose. To make thee. And God will stop at nothing to remove all the obstacles and obstructions. That the blood that was shed deals with Satan. The same blood appeases God. And the same, the same blood cleanses your conscience. Maybe tomorrow we're going to go into the book of Hebrews. 
So you see what was done when God was orchestrating our redemption from sin. But take note of this. The reason why God is doing what he's doing is because uh, in the multitude of the people is the king's honor. And Jesus Christ, Bible says, he's not, he's not ashamed to call us brethren. Because both they that are being sanctified and the one that is sanctifying, they are all of one. This is where God is heading. By the time this foundation is established in our lives, an atonement, a ransom that God didn't need to, but he did. You see, mercy, love and mercy intersecting with righteousness and justice. So that when a man perishes now, it's not because of the sin. It's because he did not believe. They say you're supposed to spend 10 years in jail, but somebody's going to be there for you. Okay, pack your load and go and meet your family. He said, no, I must, I, I, I'm the one that committed sin. You will serve the jail term. But for me, I've accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for my life. When I stand, I stand blameless. God of mercies and compassion, look with pity upon me. That's the cry of the one that is looking upon Jesus. The next line is, Father, let me call the Father. This a child return to thee. Jesus, Lord, I ask for mercy. Let me not implore in vain. All my sins are by your grace. I won't see. Would you like rise up tonight and tell yourself, both he that sanctified and they that are sanctified are all of one. And for that reason, he is not ashamed to call you brother. Then, when Jesus sees you, he calls you my brother, then. And you are wondering, oh, my Lord. And he said, my, he said, my brother, you are saying, my Lord. You are saying, my Lord, oh, Lord, Lord, Lord. There is a place where God wants you to stand with him. As a son, but when we leave the Father, we come to Jesus. Oh, he's our Savior. He's our Lord. But he's our brother. You're my friend. And you are my brother. Even though you are wrecking. That is a song for a man that understands. Can you go ahead and declare, I am accepted in the beloved. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. While I minister to that lady, thus say the Lord, I have healed these waters. The power of God rests on her. Something will happen to you. Something will come upon you. That guilt will lose its hold on your life. Why are you still in, in the prison house when the prison door is opened already? Like Paul and Silas, earthquake had happened, prison door is open, but they remain back at Latin for the, for the salvation of the jailer. But you don't need to remain in prison because we have found a ransom. 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 Even, even though the ransom is precious, is costly, we have found one. And that ransom we have found is God's only begotten son who is not the firstborn among many brethren. And now I am accepted in the beloved. You are feeling unloved. You feel all by yourself. You feel forgotten by God. I want to announce to you tonight, you belong to a royal family. You are a royal priesthood. You are a peculiar people. You are God's holy nation. God brought you out so you can show forth his glory. That is who you are. That is who you are. The Bible says, because you have been honorable in my sight, I will give Ethiopia and Sheba in exchange for you. You are honorable in God's sight. Yes. Yes, I'm accepted in the beloved. 
I don't care what happens to me and around me. I know I am accepted in the beloved. And on my journey, I have the character of Christ being formed in me. The authority of Christ, I'm entering into it. The power of God in my life is growing and finding expression. When I lay hands on the sick, they will get healed and delivered. Why? Because I look like Christ. I look like him. I resemble him. I resemble him. Jesus Christ could say, I and my father, we are one. And scripture says that the sanctifier and the sanctified are all of one. So I can now say, I and the father are one. I heard my elder brother praying and he said, Father, I thank you because I know you hear me always. Because we are of the same sort, I can pray and say, Father, I thank you because I know you hear me always. Because they that are sanctified and the sanctifier, they are all of one. We are all of one, the same substance, the same lineage, the same lineage, the same kindred spirit that we carry on our inside. You may belong to a place where they say, can anything good come out of Bethlehem? Oh, Bethlehem of Judah. Even though you look like you are the little, the smallest among the people, out of you shall come the ruler. From you. From you. From you, Isaiah. From you, Brother John. From you, Sister Grace. From you shall come something. Something of God is coming out. Something of God is coming out of you. Oh yes, there is a price. Valid consideration. Adequate price. Complete price paid. The Bible says it is impossible for the blood of goats and, and calves to make perfect those who offer the sacrifice. But Jesus Christ was offered. Hey, Jesus I will worship you with all of my heart and I will worship you with all of my strength for you are my God oh more love more power more of you in my life. Yes. Yeah, man, Baha said, Brasta Fontan Kami, Kariaman Gabalanta, Steboman Berinis, Ruda Mantata. At a point in my life, I was wondering if I was truly born again. I started praying, Oh Lord, touch me with your liquid fire. The memory of sin and the guilt of sin comes again and again until I discovered that the sins that we have forgiven was all. And that I am now accepted in the beloved. I'm a member of the royal family. I'm an heir apparent. I am a citizen of no mean city. The prize for that translation is the prize of blood. And that blood met all the cries, all the requirements for my justification. So when I stand before God, I stand as if I never sinned. 
And the Bible says, He that is born of God does not sin. For if we sin, uh, we have There's a provision. Maybe you are here, you are feeling guilt. The reason why I'm like this is because of my sins. I come to tell you, it's not so. That matter is dealt with. If God has let go, what are you still holding on to it for? This is the time to begin to celebrate so great a salvation that we have received. It's a great salvation. It is a great salvation. What we receive is a great salvation. It's so complete, it's so comprehensive that even Satan is amazed at how far God can go to save. So that when you come before God, Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. This is how you come now. Sincerely, maybe I'm talking to God and I feel like sleeping. I, just, I, I need to sleep. That's all. Because when you come, you come boldly. I see the way my children approach me. One will come and then bounce, 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 then jump. His two legs will grab me then like this. They are coming boldly. But whenever we have scores to settle, <laughs> when we have scores to settle, Everybody is just, good afternoon. I say, what did you say? Good afternoon, sir. Okay, you just respect yourself. The one who settle matters, they bounce. They look as if they are the owner of my life. I don't want to come to God any less. My daddy, my daddy, your baby is singing. I will be singing and dancing and chanting for the... That is how I come. Say, let us therefore come boldly. I need five million God between now and Friday. Thank you. Good night. Oh God, I have a need, but the last time I committed sin, I don't know if you will, you will be pleased to even give me 1.5 out of the five million. No. Hey. Say, come boldly. Come boldly to where? To the throne of grace. When you come, you begin to find things. You find, you obtain mercy. Ah, you, you were angry with the Okadama when you were coming to church because you were quarreling, you say 700, you say 500. The boy, I say 600. When you come, you receive mercy. Continue. Okadama has gone. You get what I'm saying? I've obtained mercy. The next item on the agenda is where is the grace? So one of my sons, when he called me, say, Daddy, I'm asking for food. I refuse to give me food. He's not asking beggarly. This is his father's house. In my father's house, there is a place for me. I am a child of God. It, like everybody in the kitchen are guilty if you don't attend to him. You know why? This is his father's house. And that one comes and they're they are around. Come and touch me from the back. I say, who is this? Do I know you? I say, yes, you know me. From where? I say, from your house. Which of my house? From your house. Who are you? I'm your daughter. You know me. Okay, I say, okay. Is this the Veronica? No. Is it Angela? Okay, I know. This is Angela. This is Angela. I say, no. Who is glory? Glory from where? Glory. Who are you? You are my father. How do you know my, how do you know I'm your father? I know you're my father. And that 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 ends it. You can't you can't come, you can't tell my children that they are not my children. They know. And you should know that you are a child of God. And when you come, you come boldly. Can you say I come boldly? I come boldly. I come boldly. I come boldly. Come boldly. Come boldly. Someone come boldly right now. <laughs> 